Hello everyone, my name is Angela Mansfield and I'm so glad to have you with me. In this video, we are going to take a closer look at the difference between equity, equality, and liberation while we consider what it takes in us to move our practice towards one that is liberating for ourselves and our students. I'm going to tell you a little story about how lobsters grow and help you connect that to your own growth and all the influence you have to be the change your students need you to be while you're in service to them. We're going to start out this presentation by thinking about the concept of equity. Really, culturally responsive teaching comes out of a framework of educational equity. Educational equity is a large, large universe of ideas and topics that are really quite necessary when considering the historical context that education in our country comes from. Now, the picture on your screen might be one that you are familiar with. Right now, we have stark differences in how our students experience school. In the picture, you see a portrayal of that reality. In the top left of the picture, there is a student who has several steps up, a student who is just peeking over the fence with the help of a needed support, and a student who finds themselves in a gap to begin with, needing more support and not having access and availability to the support right at their grasp. That first picture represents equality, everyone getting the same or equal support. We used to think that equality was going to be enough. If we could just give everyone the same equal access and opportunity, and it would make the inequalities disappear. That was only part of the story. The other side to that is that it allows those with access more access than before, gives some with enough just to get right over the barrier, and doesn't do enough for others who need more than just what everyone else received in order to be in the game. So then we move our gaze over to the right, to the picture depicting the same game through the lens of equity, making sure that we provide the resources, the support, the assistance to break down some of the barriers that exist so that everyone has an equitable opportunity in this picture to see that game. And when we're talking about educational equity, we're talking about being able to participate equitably in accessing learning and in education. What we really want to push for and consider moving toward is this concept of liberation. Equity is wonderful in the sense that we're getting people access to what they need, in this case, learning. We also want to consider knocking down the barriers altogether and placing our students in the game, which is what you see in the picture on the bottom left. This is what moving toward liberation means. We can do this in education through student-centered learning, giving students their own voice in their learning, and offering plenty of choice. This is very much aligned with culturally responsive teaching, which you will see as you continue to explore the multicultural, differentiated instructional strategies that signify culturally responsive instruction. Once we tear down the barriers, not only are the students heading toward liberation, but we as the educators are also heading toward liberation by expanding our practice and ability to see the whole student, meet them where they are, build authentic relationships with them, and provide the supports and resources they need. There's a space left open purposefully on the bottom right-hand side of the picture. In that space, you can imagine and contemplate what else could be added. How can you start to move your practice and your environment toward liberation? On the journey toward liberation, we are bound to experience some discomfort. Discomfort follows anything new, difficult, or outside the boundaries that we've known or operated within. That discomfort can create stress and fear that keeps us from leaning into the opportunity for growth and evolution. The work of culturally responsive instruction and educational equity is really hard work. We're pushing ourselves against biases and assumptions and experiences that we don't always know necessarily that we have, which makes our shift in stance and how we approach things difficult ultimately keeping us from our own liberation. I want to share a story I heard in a video from Dr. Abraham Tversky, 
about how lobsters grow. If you take a look at the picture of the lobster on our screen right now, you'll be reminded that a lobster is an animal made up of soft tissue that lives inside a hard shell. That shell protects the animal from harm in its environment. The problem is that the shell is very rigid and doesn't expand as the animal inside grows. Eventually, the lobster outgrows its shell and becomes so restricted inside of it. Very uncomfortable. So, the lobster finds a spot under the rocks where it will be protected by the elements underwater and potential predators, gets rid of that underside shell, and produces a new one. The lobster repeats the cycle over and over again each time the shell becomes too tight. Dr. Tversky's big aha is that the stimulus for the lobster to be able to grow is that it feels uncomfortable. When there is stress and discomfort on our path to liberation through culturally responsive instruction, that is really a signal to us that it is time to grow. When we open up our practice to add more of who our students are, we are creating a new shell for ourselves, growing and regenerating toward change and new learning that liberates us from a shell that is too small for who we are now. So, if we consider what happens to us on our own journey toward liberated classrooms, one of the beautiful things that comes with our own transformation of shedding our hypothetical shell is that we start to realize that there is so much to be done, that even inside our new shell and new ways of operating, we can still feel a bit restricted at times and want to do our part in impacting broader change. We can also get overwhelmed and even concerned by everything we want to implement and see happen. We work in a profession that is largely social and personal, so we can feel compelled to make a difference right now, especially when talking about the children and families we serve and want the best of everything for. Gorski brings up this idea of spheres of influence, which is really so important when we consider our own path to liberated teaching and learning via culturally responsive instruction. The thing that catches attention right away and connects to an old restrictive shell in the world of education is in that first line you see on the screen. Many of these disparities fall outside the purview of public schools. I want to stop right there for just a moment because this restrictive shell is something we hear over and over again from fellow educators well, I'm not a social worker, I'm a teacher. Or if only I could settle poverty or change poverty and make sure everybody has what they need. And if only their parents were more involved. Before this course, and we started to look a bit closer at the failings of systems and the existence of deep social inequities, we may have even said some of these things ourselves. And while those statements might be some of the story, now we find ourselves in search of liberation for our students and ourselves. Many of you are probably feeling a bit uncomfortable with that shell. You're probably ready to move and make things move. You're ready to expand your shell by considering deeply what is your role and what can you realistically do. Gorski goes on and says, we must recognize and address the effects these disparities have in our classrooms and schools, our spheres of influence. Then, when manageable, we can grow our spheres of influence, perhaps positioning ourselves to chip away at some of the underlying equity issues. This is important because he's asking us to expand our shells by taking a look at what is it with all of these disparities and inequities, what is it that I can control? Control, like actually push the button on. So as educators, we have to put action into Gorski's words that are really a challenge. What do we control? When considering what I can control as an educator, a lot of that is how I teach, how I view my students, it's the beliefs I have in them, it's what I present to them in the form of curriculum, materials, etc. So once I figure out what I control, then I move out and think about what are the things I can influence. 
I might not have direct control on the topic or thing, but I might be able to lend a little influence over it. So that might be things like being on a leadership team, union advisory board, influence with my teammates, or the broader school or district community. Then everything else, we have to acknowledge that it's outside of our spheres of control and influence. But that doesn't mean it is forever out of touch, out of reach. What it means is that as I focus on expanding those two other spheres, my spheres of control and influence, as I expand those and make them larger, then some of those things that are outside of my control and influence might start moving closer and eventually inside my sphere of influence. This ripple effect is where the power really exists, where we shed the old shell and grow a new one. So two of the most important questions we need to ask ourselves each time we expand and continue to grow come from educator and professional coach Elena Aguilar. Where do I focus my energies and where can I have the greatest impact? This course is focused on just that, something you all have direct control over, fostering and creating your own culturally responsive practice in your environment, in your curriculum, and in the relationships you build with your students. For your next step in expanding your shell and moving toward liberation, I want you to do some deep reflection on your own spheres of control and influence, specifically as it relates to culturally responsive instruction. Explore the three questions you see on the screen. What do your spheres of control and influence look like? Where does it make sense to focus your intentions? What will have the biggest impact? When you think about the biggest impact, I want you to think first in terms of impact on you, then impact on your students and their families then you can ripple outward from there. This would be a great place to create some very specific goals for yourself to move forward on. Thank you so much for exploring how we can move toward liberation through our own growth and spheres of influence. I'm excited to learn how you put this into action in your own practice and make connections to our modules. Take care. 